Zabuna Elijah said, um, our beloved fathers have selected a wonderful theme for us to focus on during this fast, um, during the revival of St. Mary, because each one of our fasts has to be focused towards something. There has to be a goal. We have to be um, aligned, fasting for a purpose. Um, and, and the flavor of St. Mary's fast is really special. Um, and I think it's really uh, special for us to focus on uh, the attributes of the Holy Spirit during this time. Um, and, and as Abuna said, this comes from Isaiah chapter 11. There shall come forth a rod from the root of Jesse, and a flower shall grow out of his root. The Spirit of God shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and godliness, the spirit of the fear of God shall fill him. This prophecy of Isaiah tells us about seven attributes of the Holy Spirit, and each day we'll focus on one of them here. So before we start, we're getting this prophecy from Isaiah, and we know as Orthodox Christians when we read the Scripture, uh, when we read the Old Testament, it's fully with the eyes of the New Testament. The Old Testament is fulfilled in the New Testament. The New Testament is hidden in the Old Testament. The hope and promises and salvation of the Old Testament are all pointing towards Christ and his divine economy or work of salvation. St. Augustine tells us that the New Testament was hidden in the Old Testament like a fruit is hidden in its root. He says, if you seek the fruit in its root, you'll not find it. Because, but at the same time, you wouldn't find the fruit in the branch unless it first had come from the root. So the fruit was hidden in the root. And that's how we read the Old Testament and the New Testament. They can't be separated. They're one. So this passage from Isaiah in the Old Testament tells us here, as a prophecy, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him the flower growing out of the rod of the root of Jesse, which is our Lord Jesus Christ. So what does this mean when we say that the Holy Spirit shall rest on him? That's indicating that it's happening in the future. So when we read this, you know, sometimes we read these passages kind of quickly, and it's, it's really nice. That's really, you know, really a nice thing. God's giving us a lot of nice things, and we sort of move on. But if we stop and look a little bit closely, we have to ask ourselves these questions. Doesn't the Holy Spirit always rest upon our Lord Jesus Christ? Isn't the Trinity one? Aren't the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit always united? How is it that the Holy Spirit shall rest on him? So what does Isaiah mean here? When Isaiah is indicating that the Holy Spirit shall rest on him, he means as the incarnate God, the God-man, the one who has fully united the human with the divine. He is eternally the Holy Spirit is eternally the Spirit of God, who eternally rests upon the Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, but he shall rest on the incarnate God. So therefore, as we're going to learn in very shortly, because he shall rest on the incarnate God, he shall also rest on each one of us, and that's where we come into play. That's how we have real access to the attributes of the Spirit that we're discussing uh, during these next seven days. Because St. Cyril says, St. Cyril of Alexandria, he says, he who is, the one who exists, is necessarily born of the flesh, taking all that is ours into himself. So that all that is born of the flesh, that is us corruptible and perishing beings, might rest in him. That's what happens in the incarnation. So when he says the Spirit of God shall rest on the incarnate God who took us into him, the Spirit of God shall also rest on us. Therefore, as a result of his incarnation, as a result of the work of salvation which Isaiah prophesies about, we rest in him and we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. We, as the body of Christ, are the only created beings in whom God himself dwells. God who is uncontainable, who is eternal, we are the only created being in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. And it's because of this mystery of incarnation and the, and, and, the, and the work of salvation that I can share in these attributes of the Holy Spirit in a real way. These aren't just nice words that I read, but we participate in the life of, of the Trinity and we uh, participate in these attributes in a very real way in the life of the church. In Genesis chapter 6, 
before the flood, God says, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. So at that time, the Holy Spirit leaves man, is no longer with man. And that remains the case all the way until the New Testament. Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, when our, our Lord Jesus Christ uh, is baptized in the Jordan by St. John the Baptist, and, and the voice of the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, because finally, again, the Holy Spirit can dwell in man. So this is a real thing that we have, and we celebrate this during this time, that because of St. Mary, God was able to dwell in a human being and in the human race. And the beloved St. Mary allowed this to happen because of her purity, her holiness, and her beauty. St. Cyril also says that the incarnation evidently and entirely depended on birth from a woman. So if that birth of a woman couldn't take place because St. Mary wasn't who she, who she is, who she was, we wouldn't have received this gift. It was uh, able to take place because of uh, St. Mary. And this is so profound. This is why we spend these two weeks praising St. Mary. This is why the church tells us in the Sunday Theotokeia, in the seventh part, something very similar to this passage. You are the flower of incense that has blossomed from the root of Jesse, right? So this prophecy, these attributes of the Holy Spirit, they're ours. We have to understand that we have the same spirit that the apostles received on the day of Pentecost that we celebrate during this season in the church. So the first attribute is wisdom. I wanna look at, uh, as we try to, it's really tough to talk about wisdom in a short period of time. Um, but I wanna look at just a few highlights on, on what uh, the attribute of wisdom is and how we can uh, uh, nourish our relationship with the Spirit and obtain wisdom. So I want to look at the first time we encounter St. Mary in the Gospel of St. Luke. Because right when we meet her, we read about how deeply she possesses wisdom. St. Luke says, And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. And blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. And then what? And she considered what manner of greeting this was. So she was troubled initially, but then she considered. She paused. She said, what type of greeting is this? She considered it, right? That's where her wisdom uh, came into place. How do we know this? Because right before this, we read about Zacharias. The angel of the Lord appears to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And it's almost the same thing because Zacharias says, it says when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him, right? But there's no, after that, Zacharias says to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is well advanced in years, right? And then the angel tells him, because you did not believe the word of the Lord, you shall be mute for nine months. That consideration, that pause, that's where we see the mystery of wisdom unfold in St. Mary. This brings us to the first point about wisdom that we can uh, meditate on. True wisdom, it's not being smart, being intellectual, uh, the wisdom of this world. True wisdom is to know the heart of a matter, the deep and real truths that govern a matter, and to see past the misleading layers of lies that the world, that other people, that society layers on top of uh, layers on top, or, or, or that my subconscious layers on top. But it's to see, to pierce through all the layers and to know the truth of a matter. When our Lord Jesus Christ was on trial um, with Pontius Pilate, Pilate asked him, are you a king? Okay, so he said, wisdom is to know the truth of a matter. Pilate's asking a question here that can point to the truth, that can reveal the truth. So he's knocking on the door of wisdom. He's saying, are you a king? Jesus answers, you say rightly that I'm a king. For this cause I was born. For this cause I have come into the world. That I should bear witness to the truth. There's only one truth, right? And the more we can see that truth and, and know that truth, the more wisdom we have in the spirit. Everyone who is of the truth, he, uh, our Lord continues, hears my voice. Pilate says to him, what is truth? And when he says this, he goes out again to the Jews and says to them, I find no fault in him at all. So does Pilate capture the truth of the matter here? Not quite. He got close. He knocked on the door. 
But he was only able to come up with half of the truth, which is that he finds no fault in our Lord Jesus Christ. But there's more to the story. There's more truth to uncover here that wisdom, that, that, that wisdom would have allowed him to uncover. The incarnate God, the salvation of the human race, the unity between heaven and earth, the love that governs all of this. But Pilate couldn't, Pilate couldn't see the truth, so he, he didn't act wisely here, right? But the one who does act wisely later on in the crucifixion of our Lord is the right-hand thief because he sees the truth of the matter. The thief on the left hand says, if you're a king, if you're a God, why don't you save us? But the thief on the right hand sees the truth of the matter, and because of that, he answers wisely. And that wisdom gained him the kingdom of heaven. He says, we receive the due reward of our deeds. That's the truth, right? So if I'm, a, you know, in the, if I'm in the position of the, the left-hand thief, how am I acting like I don't deserve punishment for my deeds and saying, well, why don't you save us? But he sees the truth of the matter. He says, we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Truth. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That little bit of wisdom, that little bit of ability to see the truth, to hold on to it, and to see the truth of the matter and go right to the heart of the matter, won him the kingdom of heaven. So to have wisdom is to see the truth of the matter, the objective, real truth that underlies everything. What is the truth about who I am? What is the truth about my possessions? What is the truth about my social life? What is the truth about my family life, my vocation, my career, my interactions with people on a daily basis? What is the truth of the matter? When somebody cuts me off on the highway, right? What is the truth of the matter, right? That person is a person who's created in the image of God, right? That's the truth of the matter, whether I like to admit it or not, right? But when I curse that person out, I'm deciding not to see that truth because if I saw that truth, I wouldn't curse the image of God out. In the book Beginning to Pray, the Metropolitan Anthony Bloom, he says, we are rich. Everything which we possess is a gift and sign of the love of God and the love of man. Everything we possess. It's a continuous gift of divine love. And as long as we possess nothing, Love divine is manifested continuously and fully, but everything we take into our own hands to possess is taken out of the realm of love. Certainly it becomes ours, but love is lost. And it is only those who give away everything and become aware of true, total, final, spiritual poverty and possess the love of God expressed in all his gift, the moment we try to be rich by keeping something, th something safely in our hands, we are losers, right? This is the truth of the matter. This is the truth of my possessions. The world tells me, hang on to your possessions. Get more and more and more. It doesn't matter what you do to get them. Trample the person next to you. It doesn't matter. Hang on to your possessions. Hang on to your social status. Step on somebody else to get clout. That's, what the, that's the wisdom of the world. But true wisdom of the spirit sees through the truth of the matter, knows that I'm a steward of these things. I can't close my fists on them as though they're mine, but they're given to me for a purpose. This past Sunday, we heard the gospel of the vineyard and the vine dressers. They were stewards over the vineyard, but at some point they thought they wanted to become the owners. They wanted to possess the vineyard, right? And because they wanted to possess the vineyard, they lost it. That's what happens when we don't know the truth of the fact that we are stewards, right? The truth, the wisdom about Everything that we have, that we do um, in, in, in our relationships and in our family life governs everything. Wisdom also helps us to see that the underlying principle is always that unity makes everything right. On every level, disunity is the source of strife. God created us after his image. The Holy Trinity is the perfect unity of three divine persons, and we're created in the image of the Holy Trinity. So he created us to be in harmony as he is. He created us, he created me to be in harmony with myself, to have unity of purpose, mind, soul, body, spirit, unity with God. He created me to have unity with others, unity within my household, unity of purpose, of mind, of, 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 of uh, desires together. He created me to have unity in my social circles, right? Unity in the church. We worship together. We serve together. We share in struggles together. We share in joys together. We are one. 
For what purpose? For one purpose. Unity of heaven and on earth. This idea is lost in our current age, but heaven is very much invested in us and in our walk and in our journey to heaven. And we need to be invested in heaven as well because as St. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, our citizenship is in heaven. Wisdom sees that unity is the truth, the underlying matter, that everything is solved with unity. All strife that we see within ourselves, within our relationships, within our households, on every level is related to disunity. Wisdom seeks that unity. Wisdom sees past everything else and just wants unity. Another attribute of wisdom is that wisdom is to know and recognize evil instantly, to know how evil behaves, what it looks like, to know where it lurks, where it's waiting to destroy me, what the tricks of the devil are. In the Old Testament, when Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dream, Pharaoh said, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. In him is the spirit of God and he's discerning and wise. And what do we know about Joseph from a few chapters before this? He was able to recognize evil instantly. Like a hawk, he was looking for it and he knew where it was. It says that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has kept back, kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day, and he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. And then eventually, it says she caught him by the garment saying, lie with me. But wisdom recognizes evil, and wisdom sees the truth, and wisdom knows this will destroy me. And he fled even though it cost him prison. This is the wise person who's clear and full of knowledge of where evil is lying in wait to destroy him. And he knows the truth about himself. He knows who he is. He knows who he was meant to be and how damaging sin will be. In Hebrews chapter 5, St. Paul writes, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil, to discern good and evil. Not everything I see, hear, and touch is good for me, right? But in this age, everything is so close, it's at our fingertips. We see, hear, and touch whatever we want. We, we instantly gratify our, our desires whenever we want, however we want. It's so easy to do that that I, I, I forget that wisdom should recognize that evil lies in wait for me. If someone says a piece of gossip to me, do I follow them down the path leading to evil where I'm gonna form an opinion about the person, where I'm gonna character assassinate them, where I'm gonna affirm the person who's speaking in what they're, what they're saying? Wisdom is to know the truth so deeply that I can see the evil in a simple state sentence of gossip. And I can know this is risky territory and it's where I could find myself consumed in the same thing if I don't recognize it and guard my heart from it. Matthew chapter 10, our Lord says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. Know where evil is. Know what it looks like, right? But be as harmless as a dove. Stay away from it. Have the wisdom to know the shape that it can take and how to avoid it. Wisdom is also the fuel that drives the virtues. When I do recognize sin because of wisdom, how do I fight it? How directly do I confront it? How do I avoid it? Should I correct it? Should I say something? Should I not say something? Should I act on it? Should I not act on it? Like, wisdom is what tells me how to respond in that moment. Also, when I'm pursuing goodness, wisdom tells me, how can I orient my life towards holiness and virtue? The spirit of wisdom teaches us the truth underlying all the virtues. For example, love, wisdom teaches me the truth of love, which is that God is love. I'm created in his image. I function best 
when I act according to his image. And that is love, right? Humility, I wanna grow in humility. Wisdom tells me the truth about humility, which is that when I look around at others, I see that they're better than me, why? Because I see the truth of the image that I'm created in, and I see how incongruent I am with the truth, right? And that makes me humble. That's what the spirit of wisdom does. So how do we nurture the spirit of wisdom? How do we grow deeper into it? We've likely heard this several times before. It's written all over Proverbs and the books of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Why is the fear of the Lord beginning of wisdom? Because if someone is seeking the truth of a matter, how can we know the truth if we don't know Christ, who is the truth? He is the measure of truth. We can't know the truth without knowing Christ. I can't know the truth without fearing Christ. How do I know the reality of the age to come, the reality of the unity of heaven and earth? If I can't and see past the current age, if I don't know God who is eternal, if I don't fear God who is eternal, how can I recognize goodness without the source of good who is God? That's why the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Another reason the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom is because who says that I'm trustworthy enough to receive wisdom? It's a precious gift. The Holy Spirit dwelling within me is a precious gift. If I act entitled to it or treat it cheaply or take it for granted or use it to exalt myself above others, then I'm not trustworthy enough to have wisdom. I need to fear the Lord to have the beginning of wisdom. We also need to let wisdom touch every part of our lives. Don't let any corner of your life remain dark. Let wisdom touch every corner of your life. The knowledge of truth, of eternity, of unity, of enlightenment. Wisdom needs to touch our marriages, needs to touch our families, needs to touch our friendships, our vocation. Even the care and presentation of our bodies, the use of time, the use of money. Wisdom needs to govern all of those things. In Luke chapter 12, we read the parable of the rich fool. He says, I have so many possessions. What am I going to do with all of them? Let me tear down my storehouses and build bigger ones, and then I can eat and drink and be merry. And God tells him what? Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. So wisdom needs to touch my possessions. Wisdom is what links spiritual concerns with every piece of my social existence, my occupation. It's work done for the Lord, work done in the sight of the Lord, for the service of others on earth, for my coworkers, for my family, for the poor, etc. My family life. Parents are fashioning small images of God as, as, as sculptors, as, as artists. And in doing so, in seeing the truth of the matter, that helps us to see above all of the frustrations that come along with parenting, all of the hardships that come along with parenting. Wisdom helps us to see the truth of the matter and to govern ourselves that way. Our friendships, same thing. My body, am I using my body and presenting my body in a way that gives God glory or gives me glory? Wisdom tells me the truth of what, who, what my body is for, the purpose of my body. My use of social media, the way I present myself, the way I view other people, the words I'm saying, the words I'm reading, the images, the music, the type of humor that I'm exposing myself to, the things I'm resharing, the things I'm posting, does it take into account truth? Do I use them wisely? Or am I just acting on a whim and doing whatever? That's acting without wisdom that sees the truth of the matter. So every daily decision that we make is informed by something. Something goes into every decision that we make. For Christians, wisdom has to be that thing. For us who have the Holy Spirit, in whom the Holy Spirit dwells, we, our decisions have to be governed by wisdom, wisdom. Everything that we've just discussed has been given to us as a gift. The Holy Spirit is a gift. If we do the work to cherish and nurture that gift, the attributes of the Spirit begin to take shape in us. We have the spirit of wisdom. We've received it during baptism. We've been enlightened. Baptism is enlightenment. Our spirits are enlightened. We can see and hear with an enlightenment that the world doesn't have. But yet we just 
act according to the mind of the world and we act according to the things that the world has and we neglect the gifts that we have, the real gifts that we have. These gifts are ours and in Matthew chapter 9, our Lord says, according to your faith, let it be to you. We have to believe and know the truth that we have the gift of wisdom. We have to nurture that gift. We have to train ourselves in seeing the truth in seeing evil, in seeing good. Because in Matthew chapter 13, we read that our Lord says, now he did not do many works there, many mighty works there, because of their unbelief. So we receive these gifts according to the measure of how, of, of our faith and our belief. And our faith is expressed by our actions. And our faith is expressed by our love. So the Spirit of God rests on us, as Isaiah has prophesied. And when we have emerged from the baptismal font, the Father looks at us and says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, because my Spirit now dwells in him or her. What a shame it would be if we received that Spirit and the Spirit dwells in us, yet we don't act according to the Spirit of wisdom. And we don't nurture these attributes of the Spirit and let them grow and lead our lives. So let's dedicate this remaining period of the fast to deepening our relationship with the Holy Spirit and to paying attention to each one of these attributes so that we can uh, nurture the gift that we received and care for it and live according to the wisdom uh, which is according to the age to come, the heavenly wisdom and not the wisdom of this age. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Thank you, Abuna, so much for, for enlightening us and teaching us. Abuna, it's a blessing to have Otsak here with us at St. Mark's. Come and visit us more. Um, everybody, please follow the schedule online. Um, you know all the times of the liturgies and all the services. God willing, this Saturday evening, we have His Grace Bishop Peter and His Grace Bishop Soriel joining us. We encourage everyone to be here and all the deacons to be sharing in the, in the, in, in the revival nights. Let's stand up and pray. Make us worthy to pray thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Holy bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver 